So you ready? Okay, great. Uh, we're on live stream. Hello out there in live stream land. And we appreciate you hanging with us. Um, and I hope that tonight is going to be a blessed night for you. Uh, a couple announcements is, is that, um, again, the Filmmakers Church, we're here in the Dallas, Texas area. And we're trying to gather filmmakers and Christians involved in media just to get to know them, have fellowship. Sometimes we have worship. Other times we have a teaching. And then afterwards, we pray. We take prayer requests from media people across the world. And we'll pray for those requests. And then we might go out to eat and get to know each other a little better, too. So thank you so much for joining us. And let's start out in prayer. Father, we just bless you. We bless your holy name. And we just ask that what we do tonight, what we do in media, would make an eternal difference, an eternal difference for your son, Jesus Christ. If it doesn't make that difference, Lord, then I'm asking that you would just take that away from us, remove that, and help us to focus on what will make an eternal difference in your kingdom, in Jesus' name. And, and I pray for all those here attending and all those watching, Lord, we ask that you would move on their life Speak to them and, and encourage them and build them up in the faith, Lord. And I pray that they would grab a hold of to always pray and never give up. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So uh, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. I know there's uh, uh, more news about COVID than ever before. And um, we know how to take care of it at our conferences. And so if you're... Um, you're good with it, then I'm good for you all coming out tonight. So I want to introduce our first guest, and that's Rob Skiba. Rob and I, uh, we've known each other for many years, and when I would fly down here from the D.C. area, uh, Rob and I would have talks where we'd meet together. And I remember one time, specifically, we were sitting in someone's living room, right? And you were sharing with me this vision. I believe it was. It was probably about 10 years ago. And uh, first of all, kudos for seeing that come to pass now. I mean, what perseverance. This is, if you're in media, you need to have the spirit of perseverance, okay? And if you didn't know it or not, the parable of the sower, the good soil, is the heart with perseverance. And I'm not making that up. I'm not interpreting it my way. Luke says that. Go and look at Luke's definition of the good soil. It's the one who perseveres and keeps persevering. And that persevering word means, in the Greek, cheerfully endures and cheerfully endures. That means keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it. Don't stop and God will bless you. So that's what happened with Rob. He just kept doing it and he had a, he has incredible knowledge and his background and he just kept researching and researching many things about the Nephilim, the giants that are talked about in the Bible. And then he came out with books and DVDs and all kinds of things. And he sent me a bunch of them. And me and my son, now my son's not here tonight because he just got engaged yesterday. Okay. He's my youngest. He got engaged yesterday at the park in Dallas. I can't remember what park that name was. White Oak or something. I'm not sure what it was. White Rock. That's right. And uh, so he's on cloud nine. And I'm sure he's with uh, his, uh, his fiance. So it's going to be good. And in the meantime, though, I want to introduce Rob Skiba. Rob, I want you to take it away and talk to us about uh, Seed and the Nephilim and your vision. And then we're going to see a 10-minute film that he has created. God bless you. Thanks, Tim. Thanks. Yeah, I don't know how cheerful I was for all 11 years. But <laughs> uh, as Tim mentioned, yes, Seed has been a vision that it started back in well, 2009. Now you can put the PowerPoint up. Uh, and he, I like to say he plugged a USB cable in the back of my head and downloaded 72 episodes of a TV series uh, and s s call it Seed for a variety of reasons. It should be, you, you want me to redo it? Okay, sure. Um, and it largely started as a result of this particular topic right here. How many of you heard of the Nephilim before? You, you know, everybody, all right, cool. Um, Archon is just a, simply a word that means chief commander, leader, somebody with authority, so I call it the Archon Invasion that led to the Nephilim. And the reason I got into this is because as a young person, I never really understood the quote unquote God of the Old Testament. How many of you have heard that phrase before? The God of the Old Testament versus Jesus, right? In the New Testament. And for me, it was really sort of like this good cop, bad cop scenario where in the New Testament, we had Jesus, right? This amazing loving guy, he healed people and he says, pray for your enemies and you know, do good and all this stuff. And, 
and yet there's God in the Old Testament doing all this other stuff, and we see Jesus saying things like, I and my Father are one. That did not compute in my head. <laughs> it just didn't. Um, Philip comes to Jesus and he says, you know, show us the Father and it'll be sufficient. And I'm paraphrasing this, but Jesus is like, dude, you've been with me all this time and you're asking me this? If you've seen me, you've seen my Father. Well, I was like, tilt, I don't get it. <laughs> because I read the New Testament and then I look in the Old Testament and I see God doing stuff like this, you know, utterly destroy them, show no mercy, right? Uh, destroy it utterly, all that is in there, you know, the cattle, everything with the edge of the sword. Utterly destroy them, namely the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, and so forth. And, you know, even kill the women and children. And for many people, this is a hindrance to them. You know, you're starting, you know, we're, a lot of us grew up, I grew up Baptist, right? So it was, we're New Testament Bible-believing Christians. Well, that's like opening your book, your Bible, right? Putting your thumb, your right thumb in Matthew and your, your left thumb at the end of the Old Testament and look at how much is in your left hand versus your right hand, right? How many of you would go to Barnes & Noble, find the greatest, best-selling novel of all time, skip three quarters of the book, start in the last 25% and actually think you have a clue what's going on? But how many of you know that's what how many Christians do? They spend all their time in the New Testament, not enough time in the Old Testament, so you don't really get a clue what's happening back there. And, and this is a hindrance to a lot of people. Many atheists will talk about the God of the Old Testament. He's a genocidal maniac and all that stuff. And I was, grew up in the church, got saved at age seven, but I wrestled with it myself. I was like, I don't get it. I have to just skip past it. Until I finally got to a place and understood what was going on in Genesis chapter six. I referred to it as the Genesis six experiment. Now, how many of you know the Bible mentions books that are not in the Bible? Have you ever seen that? Yeah. There's quite a number of books that are mentioned in the Bible, but they're not in the Bible. And I was like, well, where are these books? You know? Now, how many of you believe that the scriptures are divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit and written by men? Yeah, that's what it says, right? So under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's telling the authors of scripture to reference these other books, quote from them, even mentions them by name. I'm going, well, if it's good enough for the Holy Spirit to do that, maybe I should look at them too. So I started looking at some of those extra books. And three books in particular caught my attention. These are three right here, Enoch, Joshua, and Jubilees. And I refer to these as a synchronized, biblically endorsed, extra-biblical text. And the reason I recall them that way is because they're synchronized in the sense that they, say, they tell the same story in the same chronological order of events that we find in Genesis. I say they're biblically endorsed because under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Bibles, the authors of the scriptures are referring to these books and mentioning them even by name from time to time. Of course, extra biblical because they're not currently found in our canon, although they've been in and out of the canon of scripture, depending on who you talk to <laughs> and where you are in the world. Um, I've put, put them all together in one volume, that book right there I published a number of years ago, Genesis and the Synchronized Biblically Endorsed Extra Biblical Text. When I had Genesis in the King James, I grew up on King James, King James on the left and the Septuagint on the right, and I, there's some pretty notable differences between the two. Uh, then after Genesis, you have these, the full volumes of these three books. And when you put them all together, they tell a very detailed story of what I call the Genesis 6 experiment, which is rather summarized in this verse right here, Genesis 6, 4. And the Nephilim were in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same were the mighty men, which were of old the men of renown. This is where the mythologies come from in multiple cultures. Now, unfortunately, seminaries today are teaching pastors that the sons of God is a reference to the good sons of Seth, and the daughters of men is the bad daughters of Cain. Does it say that? No, it doesn't say that. It, Moses is writing here in the Torah in Genesis, right? Genesis is after the book of Job. Job predates Genesis. And Job tells you point blank that the sons of God are angels. So he understood sons of God to be angels. In fact, everybody understood the sons of God to be angels until about 160 AD when Julius Africanus showed up and says, ah, I don't think I believe that. <laughs> then other people started to question after him and now it's taught in seminaries, unfortunately, the Sethite theory. But no, angels came down on that location right there. Now, how many angels fell with Satan? One-third, right? Mm -hmm. What's one-third of 100? What percent? 33. 33.3333333. <laughs> right? Well, this individual right here, David Flynn, realized that that location, Mount Hermon, that's where the Genesis 6 experiment took place. He realized that that location is 33.33 degrees north by 33.33 degrees east from the Paris Prime Meridian. Now, we go off of Greenwich. If you look it up, you're going to see like 34.54 or something like that. But when you subtract the difference between Greenwich and Paris Prime Meridian, you get 33.33 by 33.3. So I'm like, wow, isn't that interesting that one-third of the fallen angels, right, 33.33%, and this is what I'd say a, a platoon of the fallen angels, let's say 200 of them, landed on the only geographical landmass on Earth that actually fits their number, 33.33 by 33.33. 33. 
The book of Enoch tells you that this happened in the days of Jared, they landed on Mount Hermon, and it gives you a bunch of names of their leaders, those would be the archons, the leaders of the 200, and not all of them are listed in this particular verse, there's a few that show up later, but I believe there's 23 that are named, if I remember right, and you know Paramount Pictures, you ever watch movies, Paramount Pictures shows up, and they look at the sky, and these stars come falling from the sky, and they skim over the ocean, or, or lake, or whatever it is, and there's the mountain, and then they form a looper on the top of them? Count the stars sometime. <laughs> it's the same number of stars as there are archons named in the book of Enoch. Things that make you go, hmm. I'm a visual person, so I like to put things down in graphical format so I can look at it and kind of see you know, what's happening when. Best I can figure in my research is that the archon invasion, Genesis 6 experiment happened in 3550 B.C., the book of Enoch tells you the first generation offspring of these watcher class angels were to kill each other off in a massive civil war called, later became known as the Clash of the Titans. You guys ever hear that before, Clash of the Titans? Seen the movies probably? The Greeks stylized this event and turned it into the Clash of the Titans, but that happened over a period of 500 years. At some point during that time, Enoch is born, and when you get towards the end of the 500 years, right around the 3000 BC time frame, all kinds of interesting things start to happen. You have the 3114, the Aztec calendar stone shows up, Mayan calendar, you guys remember that? 2012, December 21st, 2012, the end of the world, remember? That was a big hoo-ha. Well, that stone digs back to that time right there. Shortly after that shows up, about 20 years later, Adam dies, the first human being dies. Then we have the first generation Nephilim, the end of the Clash of the Titans happens. Then their parents, the Watchers, are judged, bound, and buried. And then we have uh, Enoch gets raptured, Enoch was not, for God took him, right? Uh, then we have a time of peace and rest, and Noah's born, and that's what his name means. His daddy named him Rest. Well, that just makes sense. It was right after the Clash of the Titans, which was probably a pretty <laughs> difficult time. In fact, Noah's daddy, Lamech, his name means despairing. He was born during the Clash of the Titans. Uh, then it's about 700 years from the time that Enoch is raptured till you get to the flood. And about 70 years after Enoch uh, is raptured, Noah's born. So he lived 600 years before the flood. So there's no other written documentation of any other incursions of angels coming down and mating with women. So I started wondering, well, why did God get so upset that he had to wipe out the whole world with the flood 600 years after all this stuff was taking place? That led me into figuring out that, you know what, there was a Genesis 6-4 pre-flood return of the Nephilim. For the sake of time, I'm not going to read the red, red text here, but these are the extra-biblical texts that line up with what we see in Genesis. So Genesis 6, verses 1 through 4, talks about the angels mating with women. Then we get verses 5 through 7 shows how God feels about the resulting violence of that. Verses 8 through 10 show, uh, reveal Noah and his sons to be genetically pure. And then 11 and 12 says the earth and all flesh becomes corrupted. How much is all? All, all right? Uh, so obviously with the exception of the you know, previous verses being Noah and his sons. Then God grows increasingly angry, angry and tells Noah to build the ark and shows him how to do it. And then we have the first mention of the three wives in verse 18. So what was going on that made all flesh become corrupted? Well, this is where some of these other texts have value to give us added insight as to what was going on there. Joshua 4.18 says, And their judges and rulers went to the daughters of men and took their wives by force from their husbands according to their choice. And the sons of men in those days took from the cattle of the earth, the beasts of the field, and the fowls of the air, and taught the mixture of animals of one species with the other in order therewith to provoke the Lord. And God saw the whole earth that it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted its ways on the earth, all men and all animals. That's as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story right there. That explains how the corruption of all flesh took place. Jubilees backs it up there. The after this of Jubilee 7 is the after that of Genesis 6-4. Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also after that. What is the that? What is the this? The previous verses in Jubilees tell you that the, the this that it's referring to was the act of the angels coming down and mating with women and producing Nephilim. Those are all judged, all that's taken care of, and it says, after that took place, after this, they sinned against the beasts and the birds and all that moved and walked on the earth, and much blood was shed on the earth, and every imagination and desire of men imagined vanity and evil continually. So the byproduct of what we now would call transhumanism, how many of you heard that phrase before, transhumanism? It's the blending of species. The act of blending of species led to violence continually, and it got so bad that God said, you know what? I'm going to have to wipe this whole place out. And that's why we have the flood. So I extend that graphic that I showed you earlier a little bit further to show you what I refer to as the, and also after that, latter-day corruption of all flesh that was taking place in the latter days of Methuselah. That's Genesis 6.3, references the last 120 years there. That was a period where Noah preached uh, repentance. Well, what do you, you, can, you be, can you repent of being born? I'm Polish. Can I repent of that? 
No. I'm so Polish to put the ski in front of the name. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Most of my friends were like, you know, Zabowski or whatever. Uh-huh. Uh, I can't repent of that. You can't repent of whatever nationality. You, you're born whatever you are. You can't repent of that. So what was he pre- re- preaching repentance for? He was preaching repentance of the act of blending species, genetic modification that was taking place there. Now, many scholars who talk about the Nephilim believe that Nephilim are only the offspring of angels mating with women. Well, it is true that angels mating with women produce Nephilim. I believe that's not the only kind of Nephilim that, there, that exist. I extend the definition. How many of you know in Genesis, he created everything to reproduce after its own kind, right? He created all these different life forms. He said everything must reproduce after its own kind. So what happens when you corrupt the image of those kinds? I believe that when you do that, you're opening up forbidden gates that ultimately leads to the creation of Nephilim. And as I was thinking those thoughts through, I happen to have these two books sitting on my desk in that order. And I'm looking, I'm like, wow, what if that's the formula? My friend Doug Hamp wrote Corrupting the Image, and right next to that was Tom and Nita Horn's book, Forbidden Gates. I'm like, wow, maybe that's the formula. If you start blending things that are never meant to be blended together, you're going to end up with that which should never exist in the first place, being Nephilim. Now, as I was thinking about that, uh, back at the time I was doing this research, the movie The Amazing Spider-Man came out. Now, this is a doctor in the movie. He lost his arm in a combat situation. He's a doctor, and he's wondering, well, what is it about lizards? You know, you can cut their tail off, and they grow back. So... What is the genetic code for limb regeneration? So he starts experimenting on mice and stuff, cuts their legs off and blends lizard DNA with the mice. And eventually he gets a a, a viable subject. The the leg grows back and he's like, aha, I figured it out. So he injects his stump there and well, what do you know? His arm grows back. Uh, The problem is he had an unfortunate side effect. (laughs) He became a giant lizard human creature that had only evil and violence continually for the rest of the movie. He started out as a good guy with good intentions And the whole rest of the movie is him giving Spider-Man a hard time. Of course, Spider-Man's also a genetic hybrid. (laughs) But, you know, I'm watching this movie and I'm going, wow, Hollywood gets it. The church is over here still arguing about the Sethite theory, and Hollywood's putting this stuff out on a regular basis. They understand what was happening there. Now, if you doubt, you know, the Nephilim, is there any evidence for giants? Yes, there's a whole lot of it, but it keeps getting covered up by institutions like the Vatican. And uh, what's that deal in Washington, D.C.? The um, Smithsonian, yeah. The Smithsonian. And and, uh, Rockwall, Texas. You guys familiar with Rockwall? It's called Rockwall because a farmer was digging one day and he found a rock and he started keep digging and found out it was a rock wall, kept digging, found out it was a really big rock wall. And then eventually they bust through it and they found rooms in it. And in one of them, there was like a cauldron with human remains in it. And then they found the skull of a being that was there. It was three times larger than our skulls. So what did they do? They put Lake Ray Hubbard over it <laughs> and covered up the evidence. But Steve Quayle, hold your questions till afterwards, we'll, we'll uh, do a Q&A. Steve Quayle put out a book right there, Genesis 6, Giants, Master Builders of Prehistoric Ancient Civilizations, giving tons and tons of historical documented evidence for the giants. Uh, you can find it even in newspapers in the United States throughout the uh, late 19th and early 20th century. They were, in fact, very big, and they were builders. It helps to explain things like this, megalithic structures around the world where you see these huge rocks. That's a six-foot-tall-ish type person right there. Uh, show you to scale the rock. And people look at that and say, how was that quarry cut and moved? Of course, ancient aliens says, oh, <laughs> aliens did it, right? Well, I'm like, no. Uh, Michael Aloof wrote a book called History of Baalbek. He said that Nimrod ruled over Lebanon at that time, and he basically contracted giants to build Baalbek. And we see in Amos 2.9 that the Amorites were as tall as cedar trees. <laughs> <laughs> says the Amorites were as tall, their height was the height of the cedars and strong as the oaks. Arnold Schwarzenegger was called the oak when he was in his bodybuilding days. So I just scaled Arnold up to the size of a cedar tree. And what do you know? No problem. <laughs> it helps you to easily understand where, you know, rocks like that could have been quarried, cut, and moved. Now, what about a return of the Nephilim in the last days? Well, we see in Matthew 24, 37, Jesus says, As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. How many of you know Noah lived 950 years? Most of the time we say Noah, we think ark. That was one year out of 950. Yeah. All right, Noah's ark, right? So 600 years before the flood, flood and 349 years after. And there's a whole lot of wild stuff going on on both sides of the flood. And Jesus said the last days would be like those days. 
The days of Jared, however, were marked by the mating of angels with humans. However, it was in the days of Noah that the creation of animal-human hybrids brought about the corruption of all flesh we read about in Genesis 6.12, which ultimately led to God's judgment with the flood. To take Jesus' words in Matthew 24, 37 quite literally, all we need to do is turn on the evening news. It's happening. There we are seeing the repeat, not of angels mating with humans, but we're seeing as it was in the days of Jared, but rather we're seeing the creation of animal-human hybrids exactly as it was in the days of Noah. How many of you have been following that? Have you guys seen the news reports? Well, there's lots of it happening right now. In the past, that we had certain bans on, they call them chimeras, chimeric research. There have been bans on that research in the past, but they're lifting those bans and they're saying, hey, especially with things like COVID and stuff, they're thinking, why don't we just do this and it's all for the benefit of man, Right? But that's what was going on in the days of Noah that led to the flood and led to the creation of all kinds of stuff, perhaps even creatures like this. This is an actual replica of a skull from Peru. This is a female. So I don't believe all Nephilim are giants. I believe that there's other manifestations like the hybrids that you see in Greek mythology, centaurs, minotaurs, and things like that, and also characters like this, um, where, yes, there are people in the world that that do what they call the cranial headboarding, where they strap boards to the baby's head to to shape it differently. Well, you got to ask yourself, what prompts a parent to do that in the first place? Why are they doing this? They're doing that to emulate something that actually existed. And some of these skulls, yes, if you strap boards to a baby's head, it will change the shape of their skull. It will not, however, increase the the cranial capacity of the brain case. It's just going to warp the shape of the skull. There are some skulls that are between 25 and 40% larger brains than we have. And they were average-sized people, you know, four to six feet tall. So I think that that's part of the corruption. I think that's part of the hybridization that there was like this throughout history. But we're seeing the blending of species right now in the news, and they're also talking about corrupting our flesh, not just with animal hybridization, but also through the blending of technology, you know, like the Borg on Star Trek, right? And Time Magazine coming out with, you know, human cloning, it's closer than you think. In 2045, the year man becomes immortal. You could go to 2045.com and read about the 2045 strategic social initiative where scientists around the world have a stated objective to achieve immortality, we would say parenthetically apart from God, by the year 2045, and they're doing so through transhumanism, through the blending of species and blending of computer, uh, with computer technology, stuff like that. As Tim mentioned, I've written a number of books on this that you guys can check out if you're interested. Lots of DVDs on it. I've, I've traveled the whole world talking about this stuff. And, you know, um, one thing I found is it's, uh, there's some good fishing out there, right? We're to be known by our fruits. Right. You know, uh, we're supposed to be fisher of men. When I started talking about the Nephilim, not only did it help myself understand God better, but I started finding lots of people who were struggling with that whole God of the Old Testament thing, having those barriers broke, blown away. And once that has been addressed, they can embrace God and realize, you know what, what he did was an act of mercy. It was an act of love to save his good creation from the corrupted creation that the fallen angels had created. Uh, so it's great. You know, I can talk to a, s- a small audience like this or thousands of people I've done in huge conferences, I've millions of views on YouTube and stuff like that. We're not reaching the world. And I came to realize, you know what, this, this TV series thing, this idea that God plugged into my head in 2009 is a way that I can get the message out to a much larger crowd, 72 episodes, hour-long dramatic television series, six seasons, 12 episodes per season. I can tell a whole lot in that, a lot more than I can do in 90 to 120 minutes with a, a film. Uh, and so what I'm about to show you is the teaser for the first episode, the pilot episode. Each hour-long episode has a teaser in five acts, punctuated by commercial breaks if it's on network TV. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I decided to do it as animation uh, because I could save a whole lot of money and do a whole lot more with a lot less. But I also realized, like, uh, like she showed us earlier, the technology is getting so good now with The Mandalorian. How many of you guys have seen them? Anybody seen The Mandalorian? Really cool stuff they're, they're doing with The Mandalorian. Now, they're doing live action against video screen. Um, and they're creating environments in the computer. And the software is getting so good now that, you know, we're at a point, they call it the uncanny valley. Have you ever heard of that before, the uncanny valley? That's a phrase they use for when you see a CGI person, and it doesn't look quite right, and there's something you you kind of, ooh, it looks cool, but it's not quite right. They call that the uncanny valley. Well, 10 years or so ago, the uncanny valley might have been like that. Now it's about like that. (laughs) Um, I didn't have the budget to go to 100% photorealistic, so our goal was, well, let's take it to 80%, because if we take it to 80%, it still looks kind of, car- kind of cartoony, so the audience doesn't get trapped in the uncanny valley. 
So we went for the 80% rule there, and um, this is our first project. I didn't have money to do a whole episode, but I had enough money to do a teaser. So this is the teaser. After the teaser will be the opening title credits, and then Act 1 and the rest of the episode. And we'll keep going as we get funding to do so. So here's the teaser. I used to believe monsters were only the product of fairy tales and myth. I was wrong. Hell's Kitchen, eh, Thompson? You kidding? This place looks like paradise by comparison. I heard that. Yeah, let's hope it stays that way. All right, boys. It's getting late. Got everything we need? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I'm heading back. You know, I was thinking, maybe after the war we can... Uh-oh. What's the matter? We got company. Looks like a couple Zeeks. Where? Six o'clock high. I don't think they've spotted us yet, though. Yeah. With any luck, they're out of fuel and headed back to Rabal. We better get a grid on this. All's you want to know we've got contact this far south. Way ahead of you, boss. Alrighty. Keep an eye on him, Cat. I'm gonna... Scratch that. We got incoming. What idea was it to send us here without a wingman? Let's cut the chatter. Let him have a cat. Roger that. Okay. You want some of this, huh? Come and get it! If this data gets into the wrong hands, it'll all be for nothing. I know. Just hang on. I'm maneuvering us over deeper waters. You know what to do. On it. Better make it fast. They're closing in on us. Use it to our advantage. Hang on, cat. See if I can kick her in a skid. That should give you a nice broadside. Got it. Thompson, get ready to drop. Homing beacon set. Opening bay doors. Okay. Here we go. Stand by. Package deployed. Closing her up. Swiss cheese here. I know, I know. I've got a misfire. Feeder's jam. Great. Thompson, can you get a shot? No, he's too high. I can't get a shot. Ah! I'm losing her. Brace yourselves. We're going down.
Cat? Thompson? You guys still with me? Hey! Hey! Anybody? Gotta get out of here before she blows! Go, ya, but go, but I'm good. Reverend Surunda! Come on! <coughs> Come on! Carlano? Hey, you still with me, buddy? Come on, we gotta get out of here, man. Cat? I think at that moment, we both realized enough blood had already been shed. Our friends were gone. Paradise was lost. Perhaps we weren't the real enemy after all. Thank you. Thank you. So as you can see, we're trying to take Christian filmmaking to another level. <laughs> uh, one of the things that's really missing in the Christian market anyway, at least from my opinion, is science fiction in fantasy. Uh, and that's largely due to the budget. <laughs> that's why so many Christian films are, you know, how many Christian films have you seen that somebody's dying of cancer and they got to learn a life lesson at the end of the movie, <laughs> right? Well, that's because that's pretty much all we could afford to do typically. So we're trying to take it to another level, and I pitch seed as lost meets the unit wrapped up in the X-Files. So if you can imagine the mystery and intrigue of something like the TV series Lost, which was very popular, uh, and the unit is a TV series about Delta Force, Special Forces guys, and X-Files, of course, deals with the weird, the supernatural aliens and government conspiracies and stuff like that. So if you could take Lost and the unit and the X-Files, put them in a blender from a biblical worldview, you get seed. So that's what we're trying to do, and thank you for giving me a chance to show it to you. Right. Have you all got any questions? Go ahead. Huh? Yeah, you had some questions earlier. Yes, ma'am. What kind of budget? Yeah, uh, when I started looking into comparable TV series out there that would be of a similar genre, 
it's anywhere from four to fifteen million dollars. Mandalorian has a ten to fifteen million dollar budget, so that's per episode. <laughs> So the stuff's expensive. However, we did this, we finished this in April, and the technology we used for it is already obsolete. <laughs> it's just not, not even a year ago. The technology is getting better, it's getting cheaper, and so that right there, the budget for that was 100000 And that was going to South Africa to do it. Uh, it would have been significantly more expensive to do here in the United States. So it's still a big budget. I, I've, I've projected our budget you know, to in the three to four million dollars per episode. Is, is what, it, and most sitcoms today are in the two to three million dollars. So we're on the very low end of episodic television budget for what we're doing. Yes? Hour. These will be hour long dramatic. Two questions, Rob. One, how has COVID affected the production and yeah. the flow of what your vision is? And yeah. number two, talk about the fundraising aspect, what you're doing to get that kind of money because this yeah. needs to be told, obviously. Yeah. But the price tag's pretty high. So price tag's high. Well, if anybody's doing any kind of production, you guys know the price tag's high just in general. Uh, right now, I'm just doing, you know, a, a TV show is an hour long. is structured with a teaser, which you just saw, then the opening title credits, and then you have five acts with commercial breaks. I don't have the money to do a whole, whole episode, so as the money comes in, I'll shoot act one. <laughs> I'm just going to keep doing it until hopefully a snowball effect takes place and people say, hey, this looks cool. I'll get behind it. How many of you seen, have seen The Chosen? I love The Chosen. <laughs> At Capernaum, yeah. Well, uh, season one was, what, $10 million raised from something like 16,000 people or something. I forget how many. Uh, and that's people walking around in robes. <laughs> so, you know, not to knock them. I think it's fantastic what they're doing. I think they're doing an excellent job. But it just gives you an idea of cost. So as far as COVID goes, um, it's been interesting because a lot of people have be had found the need to become more innovative because of COVID and because of the restrictions. So hence, like the Mandalorian, they're shooting it, well, a much bigger version of this, you know, and they call it a volume. So it's like two thirds of it is LED screens, even on the ceiling. So they're doing all of the backgrounds and stuff in the computer. They're creating environments in the computer and creating whatever props on the ground that the characters interact with. And, but the volume is so good and the technology is so good that they don't need ex external lighting. The LED screens or whatever the environment is creates the lighting. And, and with the character like the Mandalorian, he's wearing a silver reflective outfit, right? That would be a nightmare with, with green screen because you'd have to key out the green that's reflecting on him and key in whatever you want on there. Well, he's just reflecting whatever's on the LED screen. So in a way, COVID has kind of helped that type of production. You know, For us, um, uh, it's sort of like an audio drama, the way we work it. I can bring all of my actors in for an entire season, record all of the, the voices that we did. Like what we did for those characters is uh, I flew out to South Africa. We got some, they were all South African actors, by the way, all the people, the voices you heard. I interviewed people and said, hey, can you do a slightly New York accent? Can you do, and the, they did good, so I hired them. I flew out there and we put the motion capture dots on their faces, you know, and we ran the lines and stuff like that. And we transferred the data from their face dots to the characters, but now, if you've got an iPhone, they've got technology now, where all you need to do is load the app onto your iPhone, talk into your iPhone, no dots, no nothing, and it just transfers it onto the characters. And I recently bought a motion capture suit so that I can do all the physical mo movements, and all that transfers onto your characters. You that you have that, you submitted that. Yeah, the making of. He submitted the making of this film, yeah. and where he did a side-by-side -side where... Showing uh, the, the mocap. Explain what... Yeah, uh, we, I did a making a version of it where side by side I showed the, what you guys saw, and on the left side I showed the actors with the mocap dots performing the parts. So you know, kind of you could see. And I put in uh, actually the way I started this is I created a comic book, and I told my artist to draw it very specifically. I wanted the panels very specifically draw, drawn with very specific angles because I was going to use the comic book for two things: one to raise money, and two as a storyboard. So the comic book served as my storyboard that I could show the animators and say, hey, let's just do this. And they're like, okay, cool, because I could see what I wanted right there in the comic book. So uh, you know, we went out there, we did all that, and now I can bring all of my actors and record an entire season probably in a week or two, because it's just, I, all I need to do is set up iPhones in front of the actors <laughs> and have them run their lines and direct them appropriately. The rest is all in the, in the computer. So it, it, in a way, from, from the production side of things, yes, it takes a lot of time to create the environments. And everything, if I do this whole thing in CGI, we have to create all these CGI assets, right? Everything you see here would have to be made. But once it's made, 
you're just moving it around after that. So there's a high cost in the beginning, but over the course of the series, it gets cheaper and cheaper and cheaper because now you're just moving your assets around. And I've been collecting CGI assets for over 20 years, so I've got a, over a terabyte worth of assets already as it is, and there's more you can buy if you don't want to build them. So I think it's, there's a lot of opportunity here for all of you, uh, you know, as actors and writers and stuff like that, to get involved with something like this, or hopefully maybe to be inspired by what I'm trying to do and open up some ideas for you to be thinking about how you can do your projects in a similar way. Yeah, do we, we got time for one more question. Oh, as far as fundraising, okay. uh, just real quick, um, well, I'm talking about it as much as I can to try to get people aware of it, uh, but you know, we're, we're all aware of what's happening in the world today, right? And I travel in a lot of, in fact, I'm speaking at a conference in Ohio next week, uh, you know, kind of end times prophetic type stuff. All you have to do is look around, and it's real tempting to say tomorrow's the end of the world, right? We could be walking right into the tribulation period. Uh, many people would believe that. And I struggle with that myself, and every day I'm going, God, if tomorrow's the end of the world, what am I making cartoons for? <laughs> I need to be building a bunker in the backyard and storing up on, you know, God, gold, guns, and groceries, right? Get the four Gs going, right? Uh, and I prayed, I said, Father, if I'm supposed to still be working on this, I, I need confirmation. So I started to submit what you just saw to some film festivals, including the one we're going to have in a few weeks. And I, there were 17 of them around the world that I submitted to, secular and Christian. And I prayed, I said, Father, if I'm supposed to be doing this, help me to win at least three industry awards. Well, there's been five of the 17 have occurred so far. The rest are later this year. And we've, I just won two more today, as a matter of fact. We've won over a dozen. So I got four times as much as what I asked for for confirmation. So I don't know how he's going to do it. But Christians have the money. It's just getting them to put it, you know, where, you, where we want it, <laughs> hopefully, you know, because they're spending the money anyway. You know, the, the average American watches four hours of television a day, and Americans in general are spending $9.5 billion a year going to the movies. So the money's being spent. The money's there. Christians are spending that money, too. You have Netflix and Amazon and Hulu subscriptions, and you're going to the movies. We just got to find ways to get it into our projects. Anybody else have a question? Any other questions? Now, uh, first of all, let's give a big hand clap for Rob. Thank you. Yeah, Rob. Thank you. Like I said, Rob uh, has been working on this project for so many years, and I just give kudos for the perseverance there. That's Long amazing. <laughs> um, uh, if you were here for the last Filmmakers Church, you know that I taught on the 12 spies. Yeah. And in the 12 spies, you find out that when they go to the promised land to check it out, they find the giants. It says it right there. It says the, the descendants of they said the Anaks there, the descendants of the Nephilim were there. And they literally did face giants. And so I wanted Rob to give you more information on it, which was really cool. So thank you again, Rob. God bless you. Um, I got a few announcements, and then we're going to go into prayer. Let me just pull out my index card. I do everything by index cards. So sorry. it's just the way I, I work. Um, so if, just to re reiterate this for those watching on live stream, and some are watching tonight just to get this code, <laughs> and I don't blame them, but the code is 50T, and that's the special code for getting 50% off a full registration, but you only got 24 hours to do it. So I'm just doing that for those who watch in the Filmmakers Church and those who are here uh, in person. So 50 50 let number T, I mean, letter T, and you get 50% off of a full registration. And so uh, check it out. you got 24 hours to do it. And if you have any questions about Content 2021, uh, I'm here to answer those and just give you a brief thing about it. Most of you all know about our conference. Um, we generally have somewhere between, I don't know, 250, 300 people that show up at Capernaum Studios. And we're on track for that again. COVID hasn't changed that. And um, so if you haven't been to Capernaum Studios, you need to be there. That's where The Chosen was shot. And we also are building an 8,000-square-foot uh, 8, uh, soundstage. And we hope to uh, open that up in March at our second, uh, at our next conference, I mean. And so if you don't know anything about it, it's four days. And we focus on three things. Building community. Giving you exposure and igniting your spiritual passions. So we're five-star rated in building community and igniting your spiritual passion, and this time we're focusing on giving everybody we can 
exposure. Now, just so you know this, is I've been doing this for a long time. And I don't like duplicating what other people do. I don't go to other conferences to figure out what they're doing and duplicate it. God would convict me that that is sin. He wants me to come before his throne and determine what I need to do for content. And no matter how many people duplicate what we do, we're going to lead the way. So when it came to building community, we said, Lord, how do we really truly build community? And so what we did was we changed the formats of our conference so that if you came in, it's Whitney, right? If you came in and you didn't know anyone, by the time you left that day, you would know so many people. Why? Because the format is different. It demands that you build community. So we just looked at it and said, what will it take when somebody walks in this door so that people can build the teams, they can get the people they trust, and build community of what they wanted? And so we just changed it. We just found out what builds community, and we did it. So I want you to think about it. Now, last of all, but most important, we're going to pray. And if you're watching this by live stream, I want you to spend the next five or ten minutes praying where you're at. Now, which camera am I at? Right here? Connor, thank you. Uh, the, it used to have lights when I was in TV. The, the lights are not there. But, but I want you to spend five or ten minutes praying because we're going to divide up in groups and we're going to pray for the needs of the filmmakers that submitted requests. And I know you have a request. So I want you to pray for us and we're going to pray for you. So that's what we're going to do for the next five or ten minutes. And so I hope to see you at the very end in about ten minutes. God bless you. All right. Thank you so much. I really believe prayer. Um, and this is this. We're going to end it here in a moment. And then we're going to all decide if we're going to go to Cheddar's. Okay. If you want to go, great. I'm all for it. But if not, that's fine too. But. Um, I believe that prayer builds the foundation of things. Um, when I was giving you a little story earlier about how this was built over almost 30 years, and I told you that almost a little over 5,000 churches had ordered our products, right? Remember I told you that? Everyone that called in, everyone that called in to order those, we would ask them, what is your prayer request after we took the order? And we would pray right there on the phone. So since there was 10,000 orders, there was 10,000 times we literally prayed with pastors around the country. Okay. And that's, that is just the core of what we do. Um, when I was in Bible school, um, there was one uh, teacher that would start out every class with Luke 18.1. And Luke 18.1 said we should always pray and never give up, meaning we should always pray and never give up praying. And so if you've seen any of my videos, I end them with that. And recently, uh, about a year ago, God reminded me of that, even though that was um, like 35, 40 years ago. And now that I apply it everywhere I go. So I say it in my, my videos. I say it everywhere. And if you come to content, get ready, because we're going to make sure if you need prayer, we're going to give you prayer, okay? So I just want you to know that because everything we've done – all the meetings we've done, whether we've had five people or hundreds of people, remember the times we used to have like an average of 100 people? And it's because, you know, we had this like famous keynote speaker in the panel and, and we had all the glitz, glamour and glory and all that, you know, and it, all the work that came along with it. And um, but I also love to have small gatherings. Personally, I prefer the small gatherings because then I can get to know people, get to know their story, pray for them and so forth. It's easier for me. Because it builds community for me and for you. So I'm going to end it there. I want to thank you all that are watching on live stream. God bless you. If you have any questions about content, uh, just email me, cmatim at gmail.com. That's C-M-A or C is in cat, M is a man, A is in apple, Tim, T-I-M at gmail.com. And I will answer you right away. I hope to see you there at Capernaum Studios, the film set that did The Chosen. God bless you. Hope to see you next time.